Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, my name's Sarah Lethbridge. I'm the Director of Executive Education and External Relations here at the Business School. As ever, if anyone has any short course needs, um, would like to engage with any of our brilliant academics in the school, please do give me a shout. Um, in terms of our next events, the next breakfast briefing, pretty interesting one, um, how are governments using our data? So um, Joanne Redden from uh, the journalism school they've got a data justice lab so she's going to be talking about that topic on the same day which is a bit of a clash of um of events there we've got a really fantastic future of supply chains event that's been organized by our logistics and operations management section so they're a very engaged section of the business school they've been working a lot with people like Ocado, with panel pina dsv um, with the NHS in Wales. So if you want to hear about all of the cutting edge research that's happening within supply chains and logistics, I really do recommend that conference on the 24th of March. Um, we're in the scoping sort of planning stage for an evening event on the 23rd of April, um, looking at the congestion charge conundrum that we know that Cardiff's in the middle of. So that should be a really um, interesting, popular event, actually. Um, Nicole Badstuber from University College London is, is the key academic sort of voice on this topic. So she's going to be introducing, and then we've got a selection of different key people from, from the region, from the valleys, to come and talk and, and debate this um, potential problem. <laughs> Um, again, 1st of April, professional programmes. We've got a fantastic Exec MBA, a fantastic Masters of Public Leadership programme that's um, directed by Catherine Farrell in a lovely yellow um, blouse at the back. If anyone wants to talk to Catherine about the Public Leadership programme, please do. And then another interesting evening event, 2nd of April, Lord Mervyn Davis is going to be talking about democracy and capitalism. Mm. So let's hope he can sort that one out um, in a couple of hours. Um, Big heads up for our really great leadership and business administration program. Um, it's designed to be like a taster of our executive MBA. Lots of the same deliverers on our exec MBA deliver the LBA program. But it's like an, a tiny MBA without all of the hideous assignments and homework. So um, I really do recommend the program. It's really great value for money. So um, if you do know someone who could be interested, please do get them to get in contact with us. Um, I've talked about that already. And yeah, just to note that we are being streamed at the moment. Um, so please wait for a microphone when it comes to the question and answer session. So that's it from me. Um, really great pleasure to hand over now to Oriel, who's going to lead us in our session today. Thank you so much. Thanks very much indeed, Sarah. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk <laughs> a little bit at the beginning about why we did the piece of work that we've, we completed recently and uh, the point of what we're doing. So a few years ago, in fact, it's 2015, uh, we did a piece of work called the Economic Strategy for Wales. And the point of that was looking at what are the major potential economic drivers. And we discovered that renewables was really somewhere that we could make a huge difference. So we set a challenge, which was how could we meet renewable energy demand, meet energy demand in Wales 100% by renewables by 2035. Now, many of you will know the IWA well, but some of you may not know us at all. So I'll just tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do before we dive on in. So the Institute of Welsh Affairs is one of Wales's leading independent think tanks. We offer both a platform for independent comment and debate through our magazine, The Welsh Agenda, which is the longest standing current affairs magazine in Wales, long, slow journalism through which many ideas such as South Wales Metro, for instance, have been mooted over the years and our blog, Click on Wales. And we also have a series of debates in partnership with Cardiff University. We also help people understand how decisions are made in Wales. So what's reserved and what's devolved, and then how do you operate within that space in terms of policy influencing? And we undertake our own research and policy work on three key themes. One is, what does a strong, confident democracy look and feel like? What would high-performing, responsive public services uh, look like too, and how to make that happen? And then thirdly, which is the strand where this piece of work sits, a successful, clean, green and fair economy for Wales. So we're interested in the bright ideas that can transform Wales and in the things that other people can't, won't and aren't able to do because of either vested interests or they don't have the connections. So what we do is bring people together across sectors, public, private, academic, third sector, community groups and interested individuals. And we also span policy, policy areas. So that was the context, really, for this, for this piece of work. So why, why renewables? Well, 
we all know, and since we started this, this piece of work actually, the climate emergency has been declared in a number of places. So this piece of work started in 2015. It's so obviously a really practical solution, a practical solution to climate crisis. And we think a really realistic opportunity to, to really boost Welsh economy. And keeping those two purposes in mind, this is not an energy project, this is an economic project. And this is about what that means because we're all part of the economy. So we wanted to take that very broad approach. And so keeping that purpose in mind is really important as we go through the conversation this morning. We brought together stakeholders from across, from across industry, from uh, uh, district distribution network operators, from uh, academics, um, to community energy people, to landowners, to, I'm trying to think about who else, we, all, sorts of, all sorts of different people. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, and we did a three-year uh, piece of work that pulled together an evidence base for the assertions that we're making in our final report. Now, the first piece was mapping building energy demand to all buildings. And before the, before the work that we did, there was no baseline for what uh, buildings in Wales drew down in terms of energy. Now, that was undertaken by Professor Ian Knight at the Cardiff School of Architecture. And that data is available for use. So that's there if you need to go off and have a look at it. Um, the second piece of work was done by Regen, and that was a case study of Swansea Bay City region in terms of if these are the national targets, what does that look like at a regional basis? What does that actually mean? Because often these <coughs> the national targets are quite difficult to grasp in terms of, okay, so what's my role? What's our role in, in, a, in making this happen? So we wanted to look at Swansea Bay both from the point of view of it's a good microcosm of Wales in terms of offshore, onshore, rural, urban mix, and... <coughs> And uh, we modelled things with and without Lagoon, obviously, too. And then the business schools, Calvin Jones, did a piece of work on the economic impact of that. What would the investment be and what would the economic impact be as a result? And then we also extrapolated that out to a Wales-wide uh, basis. And Hugh will talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in the presentation. We also looked at what are the barriers and opportunities at a community level around the country so we did a study of six local authorities and how they're engaging with community energy organisations to make things happen in their own patches. And we listened to all sorts of stakeholders in those mixes as well to say, well, what is working and what isn't and why is that, why is that the case? And then to get around the problem, well, we can't do it because it's reserved, we did a study, and Huell did this one for us, on regulatory and policy levers and political levers too. So could we could we actually make some practical progress now? We didn't have to wait for new powers. Um, there are things that are reserved, obviously, and we can, we're happy to talk about that. And then our final report, which is this one here, which looks like this, pulled together our top 10 recommendations. The point about, the point about what we try and do is it's not the answer, it is an answer. And we tried to do something that would pull together across, across the, the spectrum what was doable now, without excuses, what is doable now? Because that's the point of making, of making progress. I'm going to hand over to Huell Lloyd, who is part of the advisory group with us and has, for the last year, been working as a, as a, as a friend of the IWA with me on following up the influencing around our recommendations. So we'll pick that up in the discussion afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, Oriel. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is the last copy of this report. We've, we've circulated, distributed something like 500. We had to reprint it uh, once. So hopefully there are a few people already out there who are trying to see what those prompts say to them about either what they should do, uh, what their organisation might do, or what their politics might do. <clears throat> so I'm going to do two things, really. I'm going to take you through the uh, 10 recommendations that came out of that final report, the synthesis of all the work that went before. Uh, I'm then going to try and relate that in a uh, sense of my experience to the foundational economy and how Wales is starting to apply itself at the national level to that concept. Uh, and then you're going to tell me what you think of it. OK? Um, but before we do that, because this is not all about me, it's actually much more about you, those of you on the inner rows will find they're either sat on or holding some post-it notes. I'd like everybody to have a post-it note because I'm going to ask you to write two things down on that post-it note as a bit of a reference point for the IWA in a, a wider context, because 
Andy and Jack here, colleagues at the IWA, they are doing further work on the foundation of economy. So I'm going to get a reference point for them before I say anything, just to start us off. So I've got two questions for you for your post-it note. <clears throat> one is uh, a number. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is very foundational and 1 is not at all foundational, would you write to like... Would you like to write a number that represents your view of energy and the energy economy. Is it very foundational? Ten, not at all foundational. One, something in between. That will depend on your understanding of the foundational economy, among other things. By all means put, I'm not sure yet. I'm waiting for Hugh to say something. That's <laughs> fair enough. Uh, leave some space, though, for if you want to answer this next question, which is on the basis of your, whatever your understanding of the foundational economy is, you will appreciate that the Welsh Government is investing in the foundational economy concept. There's been a challenge fund, there may be other things. Um, what one policy do you think would help enhance the impact of that approach in Wales? So I'm going to give you a moment to have a little think. Because, of course, these events are all about you thinking. <clears throat> when you're happy with your thoughts, would you like to pass them into the middle? And if you're on the middle, would you like to pass them down to Jack and Andy at the front of you? If you want us to talk to you about your policy idea, make sure your name is on the post-it note. If you don't want to own the policy idea, make sure your name is not on the post-it note. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> <clears throat> These two will be here all, all morning, so if you think of something as you're going, by all means, give it to them later. Thank you for that. <coughs> so I'm going to start... Oh, that's more sensitive. Um, so my first few slides are just to remind us where we're starting from. What is the energy system that we have? Uh, during the course of the three, almost four years of work, every now and again you have a conversation with somebody who says almost, you shouldn't start from here. Well, we have to start from here because these are the things we've got. So you'll see on that slide some things you may know, like the energy system is unevenly distributed, but some other things you may not know in terms of the order of uh, things that are being fueled by that energy system, both in terms of homes, vehicles, businesses, other organisations, uh, and the observation, albeit a slightly... Uh, not quite, uh, what is the modern equivalent of the back of a fag packet? Because most people don't have them anymore. Um, the back of a post-it note calculation, uh, that perhaps as much as £10 billion worth of economic value leaves Wales because the fuels and the energies we're buying are not in and of Wales. And that's not a small number. Uh, I know of some research that looked at this equation for Cornwall, and they found a lot more value left in terms of energy than they were bringing in in terms of tourism. Yet they spend a lot more money on tourism and tourism-related promotion and publicity than they did on energy. And you might wonder whether the balance between those two things is right. So that's uh, a set of uh, data points you might uh, want to bear in mind. And of course, the last one just touches on Welsh Government's current targets for renewables and ownership. Uh, this is a very high-level picture, but this is all the 
uh, fossil fuel refueling stations in Wales. There's over 500 of them. Not all of them are driven by necessarily in intra-Welsh economic activity, because some of them are clearly where they are because of the tourist flows and other things like that. Some of them are probably there because of uh, freight flows and things like that. Uh, it's not that we need to replace all of these, but it is worth bearing in mind how many of them there are and where they are. Uh, the second one is, uh, in a sense, a very high-level picture again of the electricity grid, transmission and distribution. Uh, one of the things that did come out of our work was if you take a four-region, four-sub-region view of Wales, then actually mid-Wales could be the first region in the UK and possibly in Europe that could go for a non-gas future, be an all-electric region, which brackets doesn't mean some gases because you could, of course, use that electricity to generate hydrogen and use that in a certain way. Um, but you have to go four regions, so we we'll may come back to that. And then the last one is the gas network as it exists. So that uneven distribution, perhaps, but importantly, we're starting from where we're starting. Where do we want to go? Well, this is a sort of overview of some of the attributes of a future energy system that we might want to achieve. Uh, anything that goes from fossil fuels to renewables, I think, is inherently more efficient in its energy use. There is no idling. There is no excess heat produced by a burning fuel that isn't being put to productive use. It could potentially be more aligned to the needs that we have and the places that have those needs. Uh, renewables certainly tends to be more diffuse, and you could say it's more accessible to people in the way that fossil fuels are not. Uh, and there could be an opportunity in that. <coughs> We've got to think about the journey that the system is on, because uh, we may not get straight from where we are to where we were discussing, which was something approaching 100% renewables. There might be fuel switching and transitions on the way. And of course, it's not just about the nature of the fuels and what they're being used from or where they, where they come from can affect how land is used and the choices we make in those domains. So I'm going to run through the 10 top recommendations. <clears throat> so this first one was recognizing that any journey uh, needs a first step, um, which is not meant to be a re reference to Mao Zedong, um, but that sense of we need to put some energy and effort behind where we're going, and the sooner we can make it very clear that that's what we're doing by the political statements we make, which are often realized in the money that we allocate in budgets, the better. So our proposition here was that there ought to be a low-carbon renewable driving stimulus from the Welsh Government that would give all of our proposals a leg up, but recognising that whatever Brexit is, it's not going to be good for the Welsh economy. So there's two reasons for having this stimulus. Um, the Brown Government had a low-carbon industrial strategy stimulus in 2008 in the same sort of sense. Um, so our first proposition is that any budget that the Welsh Government has, any consequentials of a Barnet formula of unallocated resources should go into a stimulus that is orientated around our recommendations. Because our recommendations, as Oriel has pointed out, are about an economic strategy, and they're certainly, as far as we could make them, orientated around retaining ownership and wealth in Wales on the back of these things. So that's the first one. Um, the second one, and in a sense it's about that retention of wealth, is let's look at our housing stock. Now, clearly, the housing minister that we have understands some of this agenda and has taken up some of the things we were talking about. Uh, in two senses, it's all about making sure we don't build any further homes that will require retrofit. Uh, the CCC, the Committee on Climate Change, reported, I think, last year in their housing study that even in 2018, 7% of homes <coughs> were being built to EPCD, which by definition, in terms of policy at least, meant they would have to be re retrofitted. Homes built in 2018. That's approaching 10,000 homes across the UK. It might be 1,500 homes in Wales. So there's something about our future home standard. Uh, the UK government has just closed its consultation on the Part L building regulations. The Welsh government's 
discussion of that is open if you want to contribute and request higher standards of the built environment. I think that closes uh, in a couple of weeks' time or in a week's time, certainly relatively straightforwardly uh, upon us. Um, but of course, we've got perhaps a million homes <clears throat> that are not of the highest standard in terms of their energy capability, their energy efficiency. Um, there's a lot of inherently local wealth in a retrofit program. And Professor Calvin Jones, if he were here, uh, could probably take the rest of our lecture telling you how much wealth there is in those things. Uh, I know uh, not so much as part of this, but as part of other things, he's done two or three studies about that retention of economic activity because it's inherently local. Um, so how we invest in that program, and clearly recommendation one, would put more money into retrofit programs by place uh, to make sure we deliver on this. So we get our housing stock to a better state. Economically, that ought to mean for many of those homeowners and tenants, their energy bills are reducing. Uh, some of their economic activity, their wealth, their incomes can be more locally retained. The third <coughs> actually relates to the fourth. Um, there's something about the scale of renewables uh, investment. Uh, a, we, we need a, a significant amount of it, but let's recognise that some of that can bring value to places and communities. It can be led by communities, can be led by local authorities, and we know that the Welsh Energy Service uh, is doing work in that domain and has been for a number of years. Uh, at the point of our report, the Welsh Government was debating how to uh, recognise a community or local share in all development. So our recommendation, trying to balance the, the trade-offs between having enough investment um, but making sure some of that ownership was shared, we settled on this range of 5 to 33%, depending on size and scale. Uh, I think it's last week the Welsh Government's policy statement on this came out. I'm not going to talk about that yet because I haven't read it in detail, but I suspect we'll have a view on whether it goes far enough and it gives those communities the opportunity uh, to take ownership and be part of this transforming energy system. Uh, it does relate to a couple of our other recommendations. The next one's on land, but there's also one about grid. And again, one of the ideas that emerged in the discussions of this piece of work, going back to Mid Wales, you'll all appreciate there's been many arguments about the right renewable deployment in Mid Wales. What's interesting is the lack of grid has meant we haven't ended up with lots of other people's wind deployment in Mid Wales, extracting wealth and sending it somewhere else. We have, with this policy, the Welsh Government's response to it, uh, the future of the grid and how that may play out, a much greater opportunity to retain some of the wealth of those future developments. So that's important. As a corollary to ownership of kit, uh, it, we felt it was important to think about how land uh, was deployed and used in support of this uh, broad ambition for 100% renewables. Um, clearly, NRW's got a key role in how land deployment works, uh, not just in the sense of we are a landowner or a land overseer and we'll have a relationship with you as a renewable provider, but as a place-based, how does our relationship with you relate to our relationship to the community we're operating in? Uh, and we felt that there was a much greater opportunity for them to think about that local benefit in the choices that they, and clearly not only they, local authorities, public service boards and others were making about the deployment of land in the growth of renewable um, deployment across the country. <clears throat> um, we talked about some of the policies that might give us sort of uh, a greater reach and ambition and speed things up. Uh, we recognised that uh, that wasn't going to just be the answer because a lot of what's required gets done in organisations. So this recommendation was looking at the capacity of those organisations and whether this is the teams around the four sub-national area deals, whether it's local authorities, whether it's the energy service itself, whether it's NRW or the Welsh Government, we could see a case for increased resource. And there's perhaps two reasons for that. One is, look at what Scotland's doing. They are putting the resource in, not just for their own um, internal policy deployments where they've chosen something that's devolved and to emphasise X over Y, 
But where you have national UK schemes, there's more than a couple of occasions where the Scottish Government has effectively said, you know what, that CERT or CESP or ECO, we want a disproportionate share of that. I'm not saying they've necessarily written it down this way, but what they've done is investing, invested in making sure a disproportionate share comes to Scotland. We should be doing the same for Wales, and that means resources, people, teams. Uh, and then there's some timely ones, and I've touched up there on the Rio 2 process. Some of you will appreciate that the regulated uh, networks for energy uh, go through a periodic process of having business plans approved and signed off by Ofgem. They're, most of them are in one at the moment, but the electricity local grids, the distribution network, their process sort of starting now to end for 2023. An absolute opportunity for the Welsh Government to resource a team of people that make sure whatever ManWeb and Western Power want to do, it's almost what we want them to do, rather than a divergent view of what's possible. So that's a really important investment, and it would support clearly the stimulus and other things. So I've touched on this in some senses. Uh, we've got the grid we've got because it's a historical proposition. Um, for me, it's a bit like the difference between a Roman road and a Norman castle. Most Roman roads still exist. We don't realise that because we've built on them and we still use them and they've got tarmac and other things. Most Norman castles don't exist, or quite a few of them don't, because they've been robbed out to make something more interesting. We're probably nearer the Roman road with the future of the grid because it's quite expensive to take kit out. But we do want to think about how it evolves to give us what we need, a more diffuse, more local, more accessible energy system. Uh, so that Rio 2 point in terms of having the right team in place, the stimulus point in terms of having the resources to support them, let's make sure that the energy planning all of the four sub-regions are doing really understands not so much the grid they could have, but the grid they actually want. Because there's a sort of, this is the grid you've got. That means you can only put these things here to attach to the grid you've got. But actually, there's a really good resource over there, or there's a really good opportunity over here. Let's try and create a grid that's nearer our opportunities that we want to make a success of. So perhaps of all of them, this and the stimulus are the two most urgent in our mind, because there are moments of opportunity and risk that need attending to. <coughs> So we touched a lot about the state and public organisations and what they do. And this recommendation was more to think about the wider economic uh, actors, because clearly private business, community entities and organisations uh, and sort of semi-public bodies all have a role in ensuring this agenda gets taken forward. Some of what they need to do is in their own hands, and we should support and encourage those people that do and be firm with those people that have yet to. Uh, but equally, we need to put in place the right support measures so that they can see the right journey of travel. Uh, I think that means uh, things like the energy planning work are going to be really helpful because they'll start to flush out for communities what is the future lo likely to look like for your part of the world. Um, some of you may have gone to yesterday's launch of the hydrogen Welsh Hydrogen Trade Association. Hydrogen is a fascinating thing because as a, a vector between different sort of primary energy things and final uses, it's, it's got amazing sort of variety of uh, ways of deployment. The problem, though, is that means everybody thinks it might be their answer. Uh, and something that needs to happen, whether it happens from Bayes at the UK level, Welsh Government, the energy planning in those four areas, is we need to start making some choices about this is really like to be about hydrogen, which then informs those businesses and the journey they might go on, or it's really not going to be about hydrogen. So something about the frame and the support framework uh, for businesses and business development is quite important too. <clears throat> uh, we then looked at uh, what you might call Welsh USPs. Uh, we picked two in the end, but there probably are three, and the third one would be hydrogen. Uh, we may come back to those. Uh, but the two we highlight in the final report are marine, and then the next slide covers the other one. And clearly, there is an opportunity there. Uh, I was lucky enough as an official and an advisor to be involved in some of the work that set the UK's journey for offshore wind going. Uh, some of it played out in that low-carbon industrial strategy in 2008. 
that Wales and or the UK needs a marine equivalent pretty soon. There's a massive global opportunity there, even if anybody might argue about the nuances and the fine balances, which technologies in which way. The sooner we start deploying, exploring, testing, the better. So that was one of our uh, identified areas. Uh, the other was bioenergy, uh, partly reflecting the nature of Wales. Um, since that observation, the CCC has reported at the sort of UK level about its view of biofuels and bioenergies. It sort of comes out into a different place. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do things. Uh, the challenge with all UK policies, it tends to level out at a UK view of trade-offs, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and in doing that, it might lose what should work in a smaller territory. And we should still look at how this plays out for us. Uh, it certainly would have an impact on some of the land use questions I touched on earlier. It would certainly play out in what sort of post-cap farm land support mechanism we want to have, uh, the future of those things, how much food we want to produce and where. And of course, food is just an energy product, actually. So there's a trade-off between these things. Uh, there's, there's definitely an opportunity not to be ignored. Um, and then finally, uh, transport. Uh, within the group of reports, and I'm not sure it's actually on that slide, thinking about it, we did two working papers. One was on finance uh, and the resources that might support this transition. The other was on transport. And this, in a way, is not so much about what needs to happen in transport. We all know it needs to decarbonise. This is about the governance and the support and the intelligence that goes around those things to make sure we make some good choices about doing that. <coughs> So how would we produce a plan that everybody signs up to? Uh, how would we make sure we have the, the national survey data to support our understanding, not just of where we are, but where we're progressing to? So the next slide, uh, this is in the report. This is taking a sort of 100% electricity outcome view and trying to capture some of the headline benefits. Now, there's lots of big megawatt numbers on there. But I think the most important ones are the 870,000 homes that would, be, that would receive the energy efficiency measures, reducing the demand on the system. Because, of course, if you can reduce demand, it makes it easier to hit the target of how much you need. Um, and then uh, it's a bit small writing. But in the wind one, you've got 2,000 full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, in the solar one, you've got 1,800 full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, and both have... Uh, you know, millions of pounds of gross value added. So there's a lot of potential in there. It is only about the electricity side, so it's, it's grand. So I've sort of finished giving you a, a top-line view of the final report. There's an awful lot of other work in each of the reports. They're all on the RWA website. Uh, if you've got a particular interest in buildings or a part of Wales uh, or politics and regulation, then each of those reports, I think, will have more value for you. Um, the BBC were kind enough to take our report and turn it into something, which I hope will now work. <laughs> Is the first time that has worked perfectly. Um, even if this may be the last time we do it, this <laughs> uh, we can send you a link to that because I think it's fantastic. Uh, it reminds us the opportunity that is just within reach. So how do we help each other reach for it? I'm going to describe is, is mostly my view, but contributions from my colleagues, but I'll take the um, what is he talking about when he says that, because uh, I've written it and I'm standing here. Uh, is a view of foundational economy and how energy might play into it. But I'm going to start with something I saw on Twitter. 
Uh, it's not that easily read, I'm afraid, but I will send it out to you. Uh, Richard is a woodsman, and I follow people who do woodsman's things, and woodswoman's things too. Um, and he put this up in a circular economy, foundation of economy proposition, um, and I think it involves basically taking your cooking oil and giving you credit so that you get a free wooden coffin. Circular economy for carbon that's foundational because it would all happen in your community. The biofuel that's going to come from your cooking oil can't be transported too far because you would lose the carbon benefit of doing that. Uh, so that's a bioenergy. The wood would be grown locally and you would probably be buried locally. Unless, like my parents, you live in Southampton and you would rather be buried in Wales. So, there's a prompt. Um, <clears throat> Lee Waters, once of the IWA, uh, but since uh, got some other interesting jobs to do. Uh, this is a quote from his uh, introduction to the Senate of the Foundation of Economy work. I think it was after the uh, competition had been launched, but possibly before the 52 projects had been chosen. But this is his opening statement about what he thought or thinks the Welsh Foundation of Economy is about. Um, so I'll just let you read that. So I'm going to draw out a few things. Uh, the first thing to say is there are lots of different views of what foundational means, uh, both in the academic world and the policy world. Uh, I'm not here to resolve that. My colleagues here are going to have a go at what it might look like in the future and the policy changes that might play out for that. So please make sure either Jack or Andy know about you if you're interested in the future framing of the foundational economy. Um, the first two I've sort of taken from that quote from Lee. Uh, something about everyday economy uh, and something about the economy that's present because people are. So we can all hold those things perhaps in our minds. Um, the four in bold are ones that I've picked up on the way. Uh, so there's something about the Preston model, uh, which of course is built on the Cleveland model, uh, which is that place-based nature of economy and trying to keep as much of your economy or a more meaningful part of your economy in its place than having it outsourced and spent far away. I know in the Cleveland model that led them with their, I think it's a teaching hospital, to create a local uh, laundry co-op so as to not ship all that economic work and activity out. I think in Preston, among other things, they discovered that uh, something like 33% of the public sector procurements in Preston and Lancashire were going out of county. That didn't need to go out of county. Uh, so they're starting to think about how that might change. Uh, implicit in both of those, but in other contexts, people talk about anchoring. Um, and you can think about anchoring, anchoring perhaps in a, a variety of ways. One way that I think about it as an energy person is heat loads as an anchor for a system. You've got a swimming pool or a school or a hospital. They can help make a system work. Um, but clearly there's a sort of economic activity. What's a big entity and how is it procuring things? This university will be an anchor institution because it will always be in Cardiff. Um, not all universities are in their place, I appreciate, but most of them are. Uh, and, of course, just to recognise it's not just about uh, goods. It might be about services. It might be infrastructures as well that play out. And some of those infrastructures might be soft as well as hard. Um, partly based on some of the things that Lee had said, partly based on some of my own work in uh, the sort of diffuse nature of renewables, uh, it occurs to me that at least part of a way of looking at uh, foundational is things that are barterable. They don't have to be cash economy based or money economy based. Uh, you know, or I can exchange my time with you. Um, so is that part of the foundational economy? I think it probably is. What might it mean? Well, we'll think about that. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that comes out of some of those bits of work and a book by uh, Angamon and Richardson, I think, called Why Nations Fail, is this whole idea of extraction and the extraction of wealth, and you might argue that a foundational economy is going to tend to be circular, it's going to keep resources flowing in and around and between. Not exclusively, but not completely extractive. So there's some things playing around in there, and as I've mentioned, uh, the team are looking at a long-term piece of work, so please talk to us about that. <clears throat> uh, how then does energy play in? 
Well, there are sort of four things going on in the transition in energy. One of them is the, the very obvious agenda of a decarbonisation challenge, the net zero that the UK government and the Welsh government and a variety of other governments, local and national, have signed up to. Uh, there's also quite a big um, and profound impact of digitisation. How many people here have got a smart meter or an EV? Okay, so some of you will see that more clearly than some of us who still have clicky meters that are not digitised. But sooner or later they all will be. Some of you might have Nest. Some of you might control your energy on, uh, on your phone. Uh, those things are all coming. Uh, some of us will resist them but they are all coming. Uh, it's inherent, I think, in, in renewables that they are decentralising. You can capture and use the sun which is shining out there here. You don't have to aggregate it somewhere and bring it back. In the same way, you know, coal is a centralising thing because it's much easier to put all the coal in one place, burn it and send the electricity out. That's changing. You're going back to a system, you might say, that was once the case with our many forefathers and four mothers of collecting our own wood in the woods. It's local. Uh, and then in some places, it's also democratising. Uh, and that can both be the sort of very sort of vote political end of it, but it can also be the ownership. Uh, how many people here, apart from me, have got shares in the community energy scheme? One or two of us. More of you could. More of you may find you want to. You'll get a better return than you might have from some of your ISAs and other things like that. So these things are happening in the energy environment. Um, so I've sort of touched on this in two or three senses. Fossil fuels and the energy that comes from them, centralised, often external to Wales since the sort of demise of coal, uh, and because of the nature of the scale of these things, almost universally owned by big, distant, uh, non-indigenous entities. Um, whereas renewables can be on your doorstep, can be used directly uh, by you and your community, uh, so much more accessible. Um, and the opportunities of that would, in my mind, tend them towards being foundational in a way that coal wouldn't have been and that oil and gas aren't. All right. <clears throat> uh, this piece of work I was involved in when I worked at IPPR, uh, and this tried to understand what a fully decentralised energy system might look like. Uh, what was fascinating, one of the academics who wrote a piece in it, uh, Nicolette, uh, who works at Sussex, she'd studied the interaction of solar uh, on social housing and what the tenants thought of it. And there's a great quote, a great, more than one great quote. One of the great quotes is, I thought it was just for posh people. Well, it's not. Uh, but you, you, know, you have to be involved in it to go past that uh, sort of stage of the journey. But there was something about uh, a couple of the tenants saying, well, we've got our solar panels, we can see our meter, we can see what it's doing, we can see we're uh, contributing to the grid, but our friends over there haven't got any. How can they benefit from our power? They want it to go somewhere else. They wanted it to stay local and be used. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, just the front cover of the fifth working paper that uh, we touched on. This was looking at regulatory powers. And I've just pulled out a couple of things from that. Uh, and perhaps the, the bottom one is the one that's sort of leading things. The charge, if that's the right word for it, and not meant to be a pun, uh, towards electric vehicle and electric vehicle charging points is going to be one of those things that makes people start to understand the energy use and the nature of the energy use of their lives. Because if you've got a car, you're going to have to start thinking not about 60 quid of petrol in your tank but some of you may already do this you might think about how many miles is that uh, with electricity you're going to be thinking about what does this power give me in capability uh, if you fix it up with a kit on your house with a battery or a bit of solar then you'll be starting to think about your house's capability uh, and all of those things will make it more accessible and give you an opportunity to think about where does that value go um, since working on this project, I've started working at something called the Active Building Centre at Swansea. Uh, they are all about homes that are near to energy self-sufficiency. Uh, the Swansea Bay City region has also got a project of homes as power stations. When you start to change the nature of how energy works for us, we start to understand what it means and what it is as a different thing. 
Uh, and that gives, it, and it gives us an opportunity to think about what we want to do with it, rather than there is light in this room. I don't know or nor care where it came from. <coughs> uh, this is a, a slide from one of Calvin's presentations. As Oriel said, he did the work on the sort of economic benefits of this journey. Uh, we had to change the Chancellor's picture. <laughs> and who knows what he may do on the 11th of March, if it's still on the 11th of March. Uh, fuel escalator is clearly an issue with the keep decarbonising journey in mind. But the relative values of those resources, you know, on the fuel, the fossil fuel side, which I'm, I'm assuming Calvin took a whatever colour picture of a fuel pump and made it black because it's bad. Um, just look at how much value is going out of that system compared to the potential value that could be more local from the renewable side of that system. So this comes from Work Package 3, and you can look at more detail, and I can provide you with the presentation it comes from, uh, should you wish. <clears throat> right, okay, penultimate slide, I think. So I'm bringing these two things back together. Clearly, energy is an everyday economic activity, even if we don't always quantify what it is and what it means to us. It is. Uh, smart meters will start telling you what your half-hourly use is, which will make you go, ooh, that's interesting. And often people, when they install a smart meter, go around and plug things in to see which ones take most power. Don't always learn from that, but at least they know that the hairdryer is this compared to the record player. Um, renewables are increasingly present in places that people are. The other one of Leeds definitions, uh, because of the diffuse nature of them, uh, they are decentralizing. Uh, and then in terms of the ones that I picked together, um, you can absolutely deploy renewables closer to use in a completely different way to the centralized fossil fuel based systems. Uh, they can be anchored, and I've picked here an example, which is about how you manage the local grid or the microgrid. That's both the software and perhaps some of the wires, but most of those wires will already exist. You know, there's an anchoring by the nature of the trading between people. So going back to Nicolette's example, if you didn't have solar on your roof and I did, we could have a peer-to-peer -peer arrangement that would start to play out. And in a sense, that might reflect the bartering side of the equation, even if there's a notional value that somebody has to calculate. Uh, and then, I, I guess I've said this more than once, uh, there's the massive potential of renewables to be circular rather than extractive. There will still be some extractive because there's always the big project and the big investment, but thankfully the Welsh Government is understanding, even though we might want to improve it, that there's an opportunity to get local and community shares in these things to keep some of that value in places. So that's why we sort of think, or I think, uh, energy is foundational. Uh, a quick slide on some implications. Um, we called for the first two in the, the report that I uh, helped put together on powers and regulatory levers. And that was the sense that uh, if the driving force of the Welsh Government's economic in investments and in interventions is the ac economic action plan, then energy should become a primary call in that as a way of recognising its foundational nature. Uh, and then it would be a foundational sector, and other things would then flow from that. So if there were another competition uh, for sort of championing projects, energy, while it's clearly represented in the selection criteria, would become much more of a deliberate thing in it, uh, and that would start to change how that works. Uh, we think there is scope for a support mechanism, uh, and that's a support mechanism for renewable entities that are part of this transition, not a supply company. And I know there's an ongoing conversation in and around Wales about whether Wales should have an energy company. It should have a company that's involved in energy, but not necessarily an energy company, because this is about the transition, business support, community support, and those other things. It's part of that capacity equation. Uh, we think by doing one and two of these, uh, you start to affect how energy planning works. And if energy planning had a Preston-like lens, looking at all those elements as part of the assets of a community and a place, you might think slightly differently about the, uh, the fuel transition of a bus fleet. It's not just about your bus fleet being refueled. It's about your bus station is in this community. If we wire your station up in the right way, then this community gets a benefit as well as you get what you need. Let's think about how these assets play out in their places. Um, I think my Welsh pronunciation is going to fail on the fifth, but 
Uh, I think that's the Welsh for waterfall. Vattenfall is the Swedish for waterfall. At what point are we going to have one of our own? It won't be doing waterfalls and it won't be doing wind, but it could be doing hydrogen, biomass, building tech, or marine. Roderick has the other way of doing it. You'll, uh, some of you will remember the Danish company Dong, uh, Danish oil and natural gas, which became Orsted. Orsted is a Danish physicist, I think. And Roderick is a Welsh solid state electrical physicist. Last night at the hydrogen event, I learned about, I think, Matthew Grove, uh, who invented in Wales, in Swansea, the fuel cell in 1848. So one way or another, we should recognise these things and start our journey towards a Vattenfall that is providing some of these things in other parts of the world and bringing wealth back to Wales. And I know there's a slightly counterintuitive, is it all right for us to extract plants when you're doing our own circular? But we need to think about how we make the most of those things. Uh, and then lastly, uh, that sense of let's put some proper resource into this. Scotland do it and have gained advantage. England are never going to do it because they're not devolved enough to understand what they need. Uh, they are doing energy planning uh, on a piecemeal basis. Um, the amount of money that Wales is already putting into energy planning is probably the equivalent of the money that Bayes is putting into England. Um, so there's an opportunity to be taken, and we should. And I think that is almost it, other than to remind you that Jack and Andy are sitting here. Questions and maybe some answers. Thank you. <coughs> Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Max Monday from Cardiff Business School. Looking at that, uh, you know, not much to, uh, um, uh, to disagree with, but would it be true to say that you know, in your, in your recommendations in the first part of your presentation, you're taking very much a supply side view of this. I didn't see too much in the recommendations about controlling demand um, uh, for energy. But it's very much a supply side um, uh, perspective. On the, uh, you know, and, and I also just wondered in your analysis that you've done, how far, how far you've actually taken account of how much energy Wales will actually need um, in, in, in the future with, I don't know, developments in ICT creating new opportunities, but also in the context that many of our, many of our biggest production point uh, energy intensive uh, companies will probably not be here at the time when some of these new um, um, technologies, I don't know, maybe get grid, uh, grid parity. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'd accept that it's less obvious but it's not that we didn't look at it. So the first work package that Ian Knight led, that was all about energy, uh, energy demand in the built environment. Uh, and that, in a sense, leads you directly to the second set of recommendations about housing energy efficiency and massively reducing that level of demand. Uh, there's the implicit shift from inherently uh, unproductive and inefficient fossil fuel use to electrification, but not just electrification. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a general observation in there. Uh, we didn't try and second-guess which entities would still be doing what in 2035, but you're right, there will be an economic change that might have implications for the level of demand. Um, but we're certainly on a... We would be on a trajectory. It's easy to get to 100% renewable if you've addressed inefficient use as well as increased your supply side. <coughs> Thank you. Any other? Oh, right there. We've got another one. <laughs> Greg Vaughan Morris from Arup. Um, thank you, Hugh. A brilliant, this brilliant presentation. Well, I was very glad uh, that you didn't actually say we need to have these particular wind projects here, we need to have these in particular solar projects here. But what my question is. Offshore wind is becoming essentially the main driver of low local energy prices. How can Wales compete against what is becoming an increasingly cheap energy supply? They're going to be doing CFDs off Scotland where the capacity factors are 50%. In Wales, it's only 30, 35%. 
It's a good question. Uh, we had an interesting conversation yesterday with an internationally renowned physicist. Uh, you don't need to know who they are, other than to say a lot of their argument was about physics-led answers. Uh, and of course, we'd like to have physics-led answers uh, that recognize the value of energy in and of a community and in and of a, well, a country. Uh, a lot of the answers are actually, though, in not just in economics, they're in the politics that frame the economics. You know, so if you think a market-led system that devo to, you know, directs itself towards cheapest anything is the answer, then you're going to rule out uh, resilience and redundancy opportunities, which will give you cover, yet eventually the cheap version, it won't fail perhaps dramatically, but there'll be a moment where it can't cope because it's so much of one thing. Uh, so I think there's a resilience argument. Uh, there's probably a wealth retention argument, which would, uh, and I think it's partly about what system is paying for what. Uh, there's lots of innovation resource in the UK. Uh, there's some resource in and around local and devolved governments uh, where you can make choices about investing, let's say, in storage, uh, which would take a bit of advantage of that price-driven thing, but try and retain some of the value in your place. Um, you know, at the Active Building Centre, sometimes they top up with cheap energy off the grid. If you've got, I think it's an octopus tariff, during the two storms, they're paying you to take power. Uh, some of these things will get more prevalent, um, but you're right, there is a challenge of the wider system sort of constraints and framing. Uh, I think we've just got to think about the best opportunities to, uh, to, on the one hand, play the system as it is. So that's where Scotland invests in drawing resources. You know, it, it is a version of gaming, but, you know, systems are, be, are there to be worked on. Um, but the other is perhaps a slightly different view, taking a different system, the system of innovation and the future of manufacturing, and use that as a device to create local ownership and wealth um, and do it that way. Yeah. And, and I think, just bearing in mind what you're saying, uh, Wales should probably do more with Innovate UK and get a disproportionate amount of that resource into Wales. Um, and it might be that we need to focus on those two or three technology areas. I mean, that's the hardest bit, I think, is as a nation, we might want to do all the things that are possible, yet you, any nation, but a small nation has only got so much resource. So let's pick two or three, not one, but two or three, and, and be hardcore about it. Uh, that will disappoint some people, uh, but it's more likely to succeed in those areas. Might be worth explaining what CFDs are, I think, to your, everybody <laughs> will know, very briefly. Oh, there's a, well, yes, so um, Contracts for Difference, it's the mechanism that BASE currently use for that forward bid uh, for the provision of uh, primarily renewables, but there's two, is there still two categories? There's one pot. There used to be uh, innovation resources and not. But it, it is that way of making sure the lights don't go out. Uh, but it's a very market-driven proposition and it's dominated by wind because wind has gone on that journey of being uh, very expensive to not expensive by investment, innovation resources, um, officials in the Brown and the coalition getting Siemens and other people to put factories on the northeast coast. Uh, all of that industrial strategy that then gives you cheap power. We should have an industrial strategy equivalent. Um, we might not be able to get CFDs because there's a lot of devolved issues in that, but we could have an industrial strategy that was all about marine. Yeah. Mm. Let's have a chat about that separately. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hi there. Uh, Tracy Thomas here calling from, uh, calling from, <laughs> thinking I'm in work, um, uh, from SSE Energy Company. Um, some people may know us as Swaylec. Um, we work with uh, social housing mm -hmm. councils and also um, housing developers. Um, and we're looking at the strategy now to ensure that any properties that we are working with become carbon zero. 
I'm very interested in, obviously, that the national grid, and, and it was great to see that you, your view with the energy market, and I completely agree that we need to look at a completely different way of working. So currently, gas is obviously installed by IGTs, independent gas transporters, underground, mm -hmm. underground pipes and everything. Do you, are you aware of how many of those companies are currently working in Wales? And have you engaged with any of those companies or any energy companies to so partner the steering, to that? The steering group had some of the energy system represented on it. It had both the DNOs and the gas networks involved, Wales and West. You'll have seen their, their map. Um, we're definitely not aware of everybody, though. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, what's fascinating is it's quite an innovatory environment. Uh, the challenge that perhaps the UK has is that Bayes is meant to have a three-year forward strategy, and it hasn't had one for more than three years. Uh, there's meant to be a white paper. I think that's almost certainly going to come out. But whether it will be a energy transition strategy is, is a slightly open question. Perhaps there's meant to be a heat strategy in it. Uh, and in the absence of those strategies, I think what's happening is you've got the older mechanisms, like CFD, that came from you know, 10 years ago and are still running along, uh, and no sense of uh, can we corral uh, and focus innovation, investment and other things on the transitions that we can now see are more likely to be the ones we need to make. It, it's not impossible that the city deal areas could do some of that, but again, they're only at the scale that they're at, and it might be on the gas question. Uh, you, you need something sort of between Bays and Wales to have that conversation, to start making a choice for this part of the world. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure from Wales and West colleagues that to take one example of biogas injection, uh, they have something like 18 injection sites in the south, southwest Cornish Dor Devonian P Peninsula, but only one in South Wales. There is a slightly technical reason for that because of investments and incentives that were in place at certain times. But you sort of think, well, how do you get more innovation into the Welsh side of the equation? Uh, the Welsh Hydrogen Trade Association was, Association was launched last night, so there is, there is interest. Uh, we weren't trying to cover all the bases, though, I don't think. Thank you so much. Um, immensely knowledgeable on the topic. Um, very important topic for Wales, particularly in light of all the climate changes issues that we're facing. So thank you so much, Aurel Hewell. Um, that brings our breakfast briefing to a close. Um, if you wanted to mingle for a little bit, have a tea or coffee, please do. And hope to see you at future events at the school. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>